Hey guys, take a look at your screen here just for a second. Here's a little bit more somber reflection here just for a moment. You're looking at the final destination of United Air Flight 232. It crashed on uh, July the 18th, not day before yesterday, July the 18th, but 25 years ago, July the 18th, July the 18th, 1989. And uh, it's hard to imagine that anybody could have survived that, isn't it? There were 302 souls aboard. And if I just looking at the pictures, I would say nobody survived that. But in actuality, 188 people survived it because of the great expertise of the, of the flight crew. That's the only way, only way to attribute that. 114 died, a whole bunch more. Most of those folks that survived were horribly, seriously wounded as a result of that. And, and I'm bringing it up because uh, it's one of the top 20 air disasters in American aviation history. Primarily because of what happened there to this jumbo jet, this DC-10 jumbo jet. Take a look at your next picture just for a moment. Here's what happened, and that's a picture of the uh, fan blades in the rear engine of this DC-10. It exploded. And the fact that there were problems there is not really what brought the, brought the plane down. What happened was, it, it was said to be impossible, what happened. Of course, it's not impossible because it happened, right? It did happen. But so improbable, the chances of this happening were one billion to one, if you can believe that. But here's what happened. When it exploded, when that fan disc exploded, it severed three hydraulic lines. And so at 37,000 feet, everybody felt the rumble and the shake. But at 37,000 feet, they were actually without hydraulics at all in the entire plane. It's amazing that they were able to come down and land as they did. Now, here's why I want to tell you about this. It's because of what happened in the fan disc. A lot of research. They're really really trying to figure out what was going on there. And here's what happened. Even though it took 15,503 Takeoffs and landings over a period of 18 years, here's what happened. In one of the titanium ingots, and that's those little things that you see just coming up to the blades, in one of those little titanium ingots, there was a microscopic nitrogen bubble. Microscopic nitrogen bubble, a weak spot. And though it took 18 years and all that stuff, it finally had enough, and the pressures of all the stuff, it finally, it finally just exploded. Now, here's really why I'm telling you about that this morning. I got bubbles. I appreciate what Curtis said earlier uh, today, and as we prepared us for the Lord's Supper, he talked about some of his bubbles. I got bubbles. Some of them I see, but some of them I don't see, right? They're hidden. And by hidden, I don't mean that I, I, I'm not talking about a blind spot. We've all got blind spots. If you think you don't, you're really, you're really mistaken. But a blind spot, somebody else sees it. And, and if you're open enough and if you're in the kind of relationships where people can kind of share with you and you welcome that, you let them know that, then they can help you see those blind spots, those potential bubbles and weaknesses and deal with it. But I'm talking about the things that are hidden that I'm not really paying any attention to at all. You deal with them the same way, whether you can see them or can't see them, but it's those bubbles, those, those weak areas that trouble me. And so I want to spend some time in my life really examining that and looking at myself and, and all of that. Now, don't misunderstand me. I try to live by the adage that life uh, is not a problem to be solved. It's an adventure to be lived. I like that. But at the same time, if that adventure is going to end well, if that adventure is going to be all that it can be, I need to spend some time looking at the bubbles, okay? So that's what we're going to do. So I want you to try to take that and set it over here in this box. And then let's open up another box, and we'll bring the boxes together in just a few minutes, okay? All right? So here's the other box. Let's open up. We're in 2 Corinthians. And the book of 2 Corinthians is about our life as followers of Jesus. It's about our mission. It's about our, our ministry. And Paul, uh, in this chapter or in this book, deals a lot with ministry and how to live out that ministry. Okay? We're going to look into chapters 10, 11, 12, and 13 over the next couple of weeks. All right? And where we're really looking this morning is in chapter 10. But I want you to understand, when you look at chapters 10, 11, and 12, uh, it's like looking at another book. Paul is really, um, uh, it's, not, you don't, it's like you don't see Paul writing like this anywhere else. Some people have thought, well, maybe that's one of the missing books of, 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 of the, in the Corinthian correspondence. We talked about that, right? There's actually four that we're sure of. There may be a fifth letter to the Corinthians. And some people say, that's part of what this is. Somewhere along in history, it kind of got attached to, attached to 2 Corinthians. And there you go. We're not really here to talk about that this morning. But it's written by, it's written by Paul. And he's uh, dealing with these detractors. 
These folks that have come in to this church that he planted, claiming to be super apostles and all that stuff, you know, they're all that and all that. And it's kind of like a hostile takeover with somebody that's built up a company and, and somebody's come in and taken it away from them. They, they were really raking him over the coals, really sending him down the river. And so you see him writing things like, well, look at chapter 11 just for a moment here. In verse 16, he says, I repeat, let no one take me for a fool. And already you're saying, wow. But if you do, then receive me just as you would a fool so that I may do a little boasting. Now, in this self-confident boasting, I'm not talking as the Lord would, but as a fool. He wants them to understand that he's kind of bowing down to some of their junk. These folks that believe appearances is, is, is really what matters. Since many are boasting in the way the world does, I too will boast. You gladly put up with fools since you're so wise. Imagine the apostle saying that to his babies, to the Corinthian church. In fact, you even put up with anyone who enslaves you or exploits you or takes advantage of you or pushes himself forward or slaps you in the face. To my shame, I admit, we were too weak for that. I wonder how they preach that on a Sunday morning there in Corinth. Hmm? So that's who he's dealing with. So I want you to understand that what we're going to look at this morning is in this context. Paul is helping them to understand what the battle is really all about, what the war is really all about. So go back to chapter 10 and verse 1. It's where this section starts, okay? I don't know. You guys ready for all this? Here's what he says. By the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you. I, Paul, who am timid, would face to face to, with you, but bold went away. Right? Part of the things that they apparently were saying about Paul is, you know, when you see him in person, he doesn't really pan out. He doesn't really stand up to his stuff. But when he's away, he writes these bold things in the letters, but he's really not all that much in, in person. So Paul is kind of taking a shot at that. He says, I beg you that when I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect to be towards some people who think that we live by the standards of this world. There's not anything about the world that's like it is in the kingdom of God. Okay? So then he comes to verses 3, 4, and 5, and that's really what we're all about this morning. War. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they, that is these weapons, have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Now, he's not just talking about the war that we wage with the world around us. Because the real battle, you guys, is not with the porn shops. It's not with the abortion clinics. It's, not with the, it's the hearts and minds of people. right? And we're here to deal with the pretensions and the arguments. And we're here to bring every thought in, their li in our lives. Every thought obedient to the will of Jesus Christ. Now, he's talking about war here. Now, I want us to take a moment or two just to kind of get his imagery so we can fully appreciate what it is that he says, this need that we have for these divinely empowered uh, weapons. Okay? And, and I've shared this with some of you before, like in the uh, uh, Band of Brothers class a couple of years ago, uh, maybe with some of you in different contexts, but I want to bring it up again so we are clear about what Paul is talking about. He's using the language of war. And when he talks about war... He's not thinking about atomic helicopters or nuclear submarines or F-16s or F-14 Tomcats or ballistic missiles and heat-seeking. No, he's talking about the way war was conducted in the first century, right? Where they fought with bows and arrows and spears and, and uh, swords and knives and rocks, catapults, all that stuff. Now, here's the thing about first century war. The main defense in first century war was a wall. And when you think about a wall, I don't want you to think about brick and mortar and sheetrock. We're talking about a wall that would go all the way around a city to protect it, right? I've seen the restoration of some of those walls. I've seen the, I've seen the, uh, uh, the ruins of some of those walls. And they're huge things. They can tower up stories above where people are. See, to defend everybody on the inside. So if you're going to take a city or a kingdom, you've got to get past the wall. You either have to go over it. Or you got to go through it or you got to go under it, right? 
Sometimes they would go over it by building up siege works so people could, you know, earthen mounds of dirt and stuff and so they could get up to the top of the wall and the enemy could jump over on the inside. I'm going to tell you, it's a huge undertaking, right? Ancient Babylon, the wall that went around that city, in fact, it included not only the city, but there were several hundred acres of farmland in there. They were going to protect themselves against siege works, all right? Here's the ancient city of Babylon. That wall was wide enough for seven chariots and horses to ride all the way around it side by side. Talk about a defense, right? The only, you're not going to go through that wall. Maybe you can go over it, or maybe you can go under it. By the way, do you know how Babylon was finally defeated? Anybody know? They went under the wall. They went under the wall. There was a river. That was their water supply. And instead of paying attention, they knew that the Medo-Persian army was out there. But instead of paying attention to business, they were inside the palace having a party. Daniel, in the book of Daniel, records this. That's the party where the hand appeared and said, Many, many, Tekel Eupharsin, you've been weighed in the balances and found wanting, king. And all the while that's going on, the Medo-Persian army is marching in underneath the wall. If you're going to deal with war, you're going to have to deal with a wall. That's the only way to deal with it. Maybe you can knock it down. That's what those catapults were for. right? Titus, when he laid siege to the ancient city of Jerusalem in 70 AD and finally brought it down, he threw boulders, huge boulders, at this wall to batter it. And you know what else he did? To kind of batter the emotional senses of the people on the inside. He would capture Jews that were trying to escape the city by the darkness of night. He would load them into the catapult and splatter them against the wall. That didn't weaken the wall at all, but it weakened the resolve of the people on the inside. War was a pretty brutal, it's always been a brutal business. But really brutal, hand-to-hand, nose-to-nose, hardcore stuff. So that's what he's thinking about, this wall. Now, as we look at this passage... Where is the wall? It's right here. Right here. It's in our hearts and it's in our minds. And who built that wall? Before you came to Jesus, your mind and your heart was enemy-held territory. Satan built that wall. And I want to tell you, it's no easy thing to breach the wall. Sometimes that battle can rage on for a long time. We can come to Jesus and be saved, absolutely. But the battle that ensues may be lifelong. Sometimes he's held and he's been a part of us so long, it takes a long, long while to do that. But here's the issue. It takes divinely empowered weapons. Y'all hear me now about this. It takes divinely empowered weapons to bring that wall down. Tough battle that's waged. Right here. You know what? I have voices in my head. Do you guys? I hear voices that tell me to do things I don't want to do. Don't look at me like that. Do you all not have voices in your head, huh? Don't you all hear things in there, right? Things that you know you ought not to do, and you hear the voice that says, do, go, pursue. Seems relentless. Yeah, where does that voice come from? It's enemy held territory. It's Satan. And the embankment and the embattlement and the walls that he's built on the inside. There's a radio program that NPR puts out, National Public Radio. It's a deal about, it's called This American Life. My son, Josh, turned me on to the program. Uh, Got lots of interesting stuff on there. And once they had a show called The Devil Within Me. And in this show, the host is asking people, how are you doing with the voice on the inside of your head that goes against the things that you know you ought to do? What do you do with that? Do you hear a voice? Do you feel enslaved to it? And, and the overwhelming response was, yeah. In fact, he says, it almost seemed as if they'd been waiting all of their lives for somebody to ask them that question. Here's one man who says, that voice is irresistible always. I'm in the thrall of that voice. Something you don't want to do? Where does that come from? A woman says, that voice is totally out of control. It has a life of its own, and I can't tame it anymore. Here's a woman who says, I actually have a name for that voice. I call it Stan. Now, that's the lady we need to worry about, not me, okay? <laughs> Stan is the guy who tells me to have that extra glass of wine. Stan is the guy who tells me to smoke. Don't tell me you've never heard that voice. It's in you. It's not out there. It's in here. Here's where the battle is. Here's where the battle is. 
A man says, and I found this one particularly interesting. I remember somehow realizing just how finely calibrated the voice was to every nuance, every part of my feelings, including the feeling that I didn't want to smoke cigarettes. And it's like the voice says to me, you might as well have another cigarette because this is it and it is what it is. Fill in the blanks. What's your struggle? This came from a woman who just got engaged. She hears her voice, and the voice says, you better try your hardest to make sure he doesn't take the ring away. But it's because, because he's going to find out the truth about you and how much you suck. So you better distract him with a really thin body. His last question was, do you feel like the voice is winning? And there was one woman that really captured all of their responses. She says, right now, yeah, I think I'm in serious trouble, to be honest. Let me tell you something about the voice, about this battleground, this war that we're engaged in. The voice always wins unless you have divinely empowered weapons. Always. No exception. Don't think your willpower is strong enough. In fact, studies have indicated that the stronger your willpower, the more likely it is that you are to fall. Isn't that unbelievable? It's called restraint bias. Sometimes I know my mind is made up that I'm not going to overeat again for the first 30 minutes after I'm so stuffed I can't move. I say I'm never going to do that again. Everybody, you're laughing because you've done the same thing, right? It's called restraint bias. Where is it tomorrow? The voice is incessant. It will always win. You know what the voice represents? It represents bubbles. Yeah, it does. And I know you want to think, I want to think, that I'm pretty much in control of myself and of my, of my stuff, but I'm not really. You've got a subconscious mind, you guys. And, and I, I've thought about it this way. Maybe this is not exactly accurate, but it helps me understand it. This subconscious mind is like this huge ocean with all the currents and the swells. And my conscious mind is kind of riding on that. And I don't realize how strong and powerful it actually is. Subconscious mind, that's where all the experiences of your life are stored, right? All of it. All of it is right there. And a lot of the views that we have today and a lot of the actions that we take today, sometimes you wonder, why did I do that? Why did I? It stems out of this subconscious reality. I'm not making this stuff up. It stems from that subconscious reality. It's amazing how many lies we actually believe until we challenge those things. Things that we have picked up on, things that have accrued to us all of our lives. That stuff, does it impact you even though it's some of your subconscious self? Absolutely. It Understand the war that we're in. That's why we're talking about this. Understand the war that we are involved in. You know where they, well, let me put it this way. Subconscious mind is where triggers live. You know what a trigger is? That's the thing that, that's that some, something inside of you that triggers the impulse that impacts your behavior. I'm not making this up. You can't make up this stuff. Triggers are what really hurt people that are, uh, have addictive behaviors. And by the way, I would say that the majority of us in here are addicted to something. Your subconscious mind is where those triggers are. That's why somebody who's, let's say, an alcoholic, and he goes through, he goes through rehab, the chemical addiction, you can deal with that in a certain length of time. But somehow it seems like a lot of times he falls back into it. You know why? Because he goes back to the same family system and the same kind of friend system, and those systems are plugged into your subconscious mind, and triggers are everywhere. Am I saying you gotta, he's got to leave his family? No, I'm just saying you've got to understand the whole picture. We're at war. This is Satan's territory. Where is Satan's territory? Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2 that this world is his world. Where does he fight? Where does he carry out the battle? Once again, is it in the abortion clinics? Is it in the porn shop? It's right here. It's in me. And it's in you. And if we think it's out there, all the better for him. That way you'll never see the bubbles. Or at least you won't pay attention to them. See? See? Subconsciously, we are, listen, let me tell you studies they've done on this, just to be, I don't want to belabor it, but just think about this just for a minute. They did a, they did a study where they told people to get in this big room and walk wherever you want to walk. Just walk wherever you want to walk. Here are the rules. Don't talk to anybody else, but just walk. Just, just move around. Keep moving. Don't stop. 
and don't talk. Just move. Do whatever you want to do, wherever you want to go, do it. Here's five bucks for the experiment. Everybody say, hey, five bucks, great, I'll do this. Now, what they didn't know was that there were three or four people in there that the researchers had gotten together and said, we want you to walk this way precisely and do this. Three or four people. Do you know what they discovered? Time after time after time after time, everybody followed the people that looked like they knew where they were going, without exception. It didn't matter if the group was hundreds of people or if it was just half a dozen people. They always did. In fact, there's a statistic that has emerged out of those years of studies. 5% of the people can influence the other 95% of the people, up to 200 people. And you thought you were doing that all, all on your own. Not really. You know what psychologists call that? They call it peer pressure. And actually, when you think about it, and again, I just want us to understand the battleground. You guys with me okay? Just to understand the battleground. We're like birds and termites. And I'm not trying, I mean, I'm at, the, I'm at the middle, I'm a termite, really, when you get down to it, or a bird. You ever bird hunt in a field, or not bird hunt, you're walking through a field, and all these birds, it looks like they just take off at once. Right? Have you ever noticed that? Or, they're, or, or you're walking, you see them in the sky, hundreds of birds, and they all go this way. And then they all go that way. It's like there is a, a huge consciousness, another brain somewhere that's guiding all. Come on, don't look at me like that. Do you know what I'm talking about? You've seen that. You've seen that. Do you know really what's going on? The bird right here is just doing what the bird right here is doing. The bird right there is doing what this bird and this bird and this bird. Not a collective consciousness. They're all doing what they see. Termites are the same way. Termite does not get up in the morning and say, Well, I had that two by four in the bedroom yesterday. I think I'll mosey on over to the bathroom and get a drink of water. Start eating some subflora today. What are you guys going to do? Well, I think I'm going to go up to the... It doesn't work that way. Termite does what the termite next to him is doing. That's the, way he, that's the way they move. That's the way they go. I think we're pretty much the same way. Yeah. And we want to think that we're not being influenced, but we are. We are. There was a study they did with, by the way, I don't know where you shop for groceries. Do they play music where you shop for groceries? You're afraid to stick your hand up? Do they? Yeah. I mean, I, I honestly, I don't know if they do where I do or not. I never pay attention to it, right? Consciously, I'm not. Subconsciously. Here's the studies they've done over and over and over again. They got into this grocery store, and so one day they would play nothing but French music. Just French music. Guess what? The vast majority of people who bought wine, guess what kind of wine they bought? The next day, they played German music. Guess what the majority of people who bought wine, guess what kind of wine they bought? I want to think that I'm kind of the boss of my stuff. But I want to understand my mind and the way it works. And I'm not. And you may be thinking that you've got all this under control. Okay? I want to tell you honestly and for sure, why is it that you sometimes say to yourself, why did I do that? Why did I do that? What in the world got a hold of me? <laughs> you know what it's called? Rationalization. And we rationalize the actions that we take that are not in keeping with the things that we believe. And if you don't think you rationalize, let me ask you something here real quick. Or let me just tell you this. You know what the number one key is, I think, to the, you know, the fact that you're rationalizing? It's delay. Because you don't do anything about it right then, see? You wait. You wait. It's particularly, that's a key, that's a dead giveaway that you're rationalizing your stuff. Because we can't hardly live with these conflicts on the inside. So we rationalize it. And a good way to know is, that, are you delaying? Are you putting, it really is, it really shows up in those things that are kind of primal, like eating or sex, for example. Maybe things are not going so well at home. And there's this person at work. And you're really good friends, right? And then it becomes, and you know it, you see it, you realize it. Maybe it's become something a little bit more than that. And you know that you need to not have lunch with them anymore. But you know what? As you sit down to eat lunch with them again, yet one more time, you say, I'll deal with this tomorrow. 
or your heart is pounding as you're racing toward a porn site, hoping your wife doesn't wake up. And you say, you know what? I won't do it anymore after this time. Whether it's pornography or whatever it is, I'm telling you, I know you have those thoughts. Delay, it rationalizes your stuff, see? Now, Paul's not the one to come up with this idea that the battle's on the inside. I want us to, I'm saying all of that because I want us to understand where the battle is. And I want us to understand what we're up against. We can mess around with externals all day long and feel okay about it, feel good about it, feel whatever. But the battle is in here. Here's where the bubbles are. Here's where the war is. Now, I want you to think about something that Jesus said. Look at Mark chapter 7 just for a moment. What time is it there on that clock? I can't see that up there. Somebody just tell me what time is it? It ain't noon. <laughs> You're such a funny guy. Look at this. Here's what's happening in Mark chapter 7. Some religious people have come up to Jesus and they said, How come your dudes don't wash their hands like the rest of us do? Now, you understand what they're talking about. They're talking about this legalistic approach. And they're looking at religion like it's something out here. You look right. You walk right. You talk right. You smell right. You must be right. Uh Uh-uh. Jesus didn't take that. He didn't buy that. Right? And he says, here's what the problem is with you guys. He says in verse 6, you honor me with your lips, but your hearts are far away. Where the battle really is, it's it's not even close. So he says, you worship me in vain. Your teachings are but rules taught by men. He talks some more about that. But then in verse 14, here's what he says. Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. How many times do you see Jesus speaking with that kind of force? What? Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a man can make him unclean by going into him. Rather, it's what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. Verse 20. What comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. For from within, out of men's hearts, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these, that's all in, where's that? And I want to tell you, I want, I've heard of people, it's like with a prayer and they come to Jesus and everything changes and everything's broken. I, I, got, I, I hear that, I, I get that. That's not been my experience. It's like a daily struggle. I'm fighting the wall. Right? I'm just fighting the wall. Now, look, we flip back to the Old Testament just for a second. Look at Jeremiah 17, verse 9. He's talking about this inner battle as well. He says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Jeremiah's a pretty sharp guy sometimes, right? The most deceitful thing in the universe is right in here. And the number one deceit that it pulls over in my life is to me. And I can't cure it. And I want to be able to cure it. I want to think there's an answer to this, right? In fact, he says you can't even understand it. Wisest man that ever lived up until Jesus in the book of Proverbs. Look at what he says in chapter 4 and verse 23. Above all else, guard your heart. It is the wellspring of life. Everything comes from within. And the most important engagement that you have is what you're doing right here. Are you dealing with the bubbles? Above all else, he says. Pay attention to that. All right. The only way, if it's beyond cure, if it's so deceitful, I can't see. And here's the main problem I have with looking at my own stuff. I'm looking at my stuff through my stuff. Does that make sense to you guys? That's why I don't see it. I'm looking at my stuff through my stuff. That's why the blind spots, I need somebody to point it out. It's the hidden things. Maybe it's, maybe it's, just, it's just all of it. Here's the war. Here's the battle. Here it is. What are those divinely empowered weapons? I was going to take about another 10 minutes here, but I don't have 10 minutes. So I'm just going to list them. You guys ready? Here it is. Number one, the Holy Spirit of God. Oh, you're looking for something, you know, man, I wish you would just tell me something I can put my teeth into. This is it. This is your birthright. Seek, prayerfully seek 
The Holy Spirit of God. The indwelling of that Spirit. Seek that. I want to tell you, that is the... Didn't we learn anything from the Babylonian captivity? By the way, that's our spiritual heritage as God's people. What was there to learn there? Let God speak out of Ezekiel 36 and other passages as well. When he says things like, look... You, <laughs> The, the whole thing demonstrated you're not able to do. So let me tell you what's going to happen. I'm going to cleanse you. I'm going to wash you with pure water. And then I'm going to live inside of you to empower you to do my will. And when the day of Pentecost came and the Spirit fell out on mankind, Peter stood up and said, this is it. What he was talking about was the indwelling Spirit. Once again, I want to say this, not baptism. Baptism. And you say, Mark, are you going to go say that again? Yeah, I am. You know why? Because we're, one of these days, let's get this and understand, the Holy Spirit of God lives within us. And He empowers us. And that's God's design. We were going to look at Ephesians 1 at a prayer. Don't have time. Ephesians 3, a prayer. We don't. Yeah, let's look at the Ephesians 3 one. Look at Ephesians 3 just for a second. Because in the book of Ephesians, Paul is once again talking about this war that we're in. In fact, the whole book is about this cosmic battle that we're involved in. And he prays twice for the Ephesians. Look what he says in Ephesians 3 and verse 14. For this reason I kneel before the Father from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. There's the power. It's not our ability to reason through it. Avail yourself of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. That's why he says in Ephesians chapter 5, be filled with the Spirit. You can be empty. We've talked about that before, too. And one day we're going to all say, yeah, I get that. Seek him, pursue him, find him. Number two, ammunition. Give the Holy Spirit ammunition. And that is the Word of God. In Ephesians chapter 6, it's again, he just, it's just so, wow, just look at this. Verse 10, he says, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the unseen realms. What is he saying to us, brothers? Hey, my sisters, what is he saying to us? What you see is not the issue. What's going on in here? What's happening with your bubbles? This is a spiritual war. And you need divinely empowered weapons. Be filled with the Spirit of God and give Him ammunition. Because as He talks about the armor of God, look at what He says in verse 17. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword, that's a weapon, of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Please, please, please. Get into the Word. Don't just talk about it. Don't, you know what? I'll do that tomorrow. That's a good idea. Did you hear what Mark said? Yeah, let's do that tomorrow. Today. Today. Give him ammunition. Yeah. Now look at this. Here's a third one. Not really a part of Paul's plan here, but it fits. Stay with it. Make up your mind and stay with it. Did you know it takes 21 days to form a new habit? Break an old one and start a new one. It does. 21 days. Stay with it. Stay with it. Stay with it. Can we serve you somehow today? Let us know about it as we stand and sing. Behold, he comes riding on the cloud, shining like the sun. At the trumpet calls, a little voice. It's the year of Jubilee. Till salvation comes, behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, lift your voice, you have to believe, and out of Zion till salvation comes. Lift your voice, you have to believe.